Hey everyone, it's Brett from Misfit Media, and I'm sitting here with Ben Ho, who is a really interesting person. He's been in the restaurant space for about 20 years, and he's been half chef and half technologist. Uh, and so without further ado, Ben, tell us about yourself. Uh, we're happy to have you. Um, what's going on? Hey, Brett. Uh, thanks for having me on the, uh, on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Of course. Um, yeah, I've, I've been in the industry for a long time, um, you know, in terms of on the restaurant side and on the technology side. Uh, most recently, I was director of I was over at Toast, uh, which does basically restaurant POS systems, uh, one of the fastest growing uh, restaurant tech startups in the country. Um, and I was the director of engineering overseeing the teams that owned the restaurant operations, as well as the kitchen. So, um, you know, the very, very core of, of what uh, Toast happened to do for restaurants. Very cool. um, and before that, I spent 10 years as a professional chef a uh, long, long, long time ago. And so... Um, you know, love food, love the industry, um, and have deep experience in that domain as well. Absolutely. And so um, tell us how that happened. So you, you were a chef, you dove into tech. What, what, what happened there? <laughs> the stories that it, it's a lot, it's a very interesting uh, yeah. street path. Uh, I actually started in tech. Um, I was in, I went to, uh, I was in computer science um, or electrical engineering in Canada's uh, best engineering school. University of Waterloo in the late 90s. And so um, I graduated right after the first dot-com boom. And um, in the middle of that first recession in 2001, uh, things really sucked um, and I felt really frustrated. So I decided to leave. I was like, get it, I'm gonna go do something else. I can't make an impact. Yep. And so I, I decided to do something else that I loved and I used to love cooking. So I decided to become a chef. And so um, I did an old school style apprenticeship under uh, Chef, uh, Peter Polson and Chef Tanya Wijaya in Toronto. Uh, There's an old school way where you're sort of the chef slave for the next four years. Mm -hmm. And over the next, oh geez, I, I, over the next 10 years, I worked my way through the industry. I uh, had a chance to work for some of the best chefs in Toronto. I worked for, my last day uh, with Sousa Lee was the day he happened to be on uh, Iron Chef America. Wow. And then I ended up, I wanted to actually find a, the, the highest levels of what you could do in food. And so I actually, it's funny, I actually uh, shipped my knives uh, via FedEx to my brothers uh, in New York and slept on his couch for four months. And so I did a tour of all these different restaurants in New York, wow. trying to find the highest level I could. And, um, you, know, you know, in that time frame, as well as even later on, I had the chance to re work at some really, really good restaurants like um, Babo, Le Bernardin, Perse, Danielle, Gramercy Tavern, WD50. Wow. Um, basically doing a tour to try to figure out like what, what spoke to me and what didn't. You know, um, I ended up accepting an offer uh, to work for um, uh, to be a sous chef for Chef Greg Kuntz uh, in the late uh, 2000, around 2008 time frame. Um, and so I was at Cafe Grey uh, and unfortunately Cafe Grey closed from the 2009 recession. That was right around the time that I uh, uh, was uh, in New York. Though. Got it. Got it. And then working as a chef, obviously learning all that and how that works and then moving into tech. Talk to us how, how that happened. <laughs> right, a little unconventional, right? Um, yeah, that was an, an interesting story too. So even when I was a chef, like I'd get home at two in the morning and, and go read up on Apple News and this and that, yep, and stay up to like four or five in the morning. So I actually never really fully left tech either. You know, those are like my, my two loves. I got a chef half of my brain and a technologist half of my brain. Fantastic. And what happened in two thousand nine, as as if everyone remembers, was um, iPhone. The mobile game changed. Like Apple went and launched the iPhone, and it changed the world. It was a communication device, and an internet browser, and an MP3 player, and all that stuff rolled into one. And when I looked at it, I was like, "Oh wow, this is going to change how everyone uses technology." My my mom will use email now. Um, and so when I actually, they actually had this SDK where you could actually write apps. And so when I actually went and downloaded it and played around, I'm like, "Hey, I know how to do this. Like that's what I learned in college." Yep. And so I decided to make a switch back, um, which meant I had to learn how to code. Um, I had to learn how to do technology again. And at the yep. time, I, I actually really wanted to do restaurant tech because I knew how badly the industry needed it. Like we were doing everything by hand. And we, in a lot of ways, a lot of restaurants still do everything by hand. Totally. And so um, the initial hope was to do restaurant technology. Turns out startups and uh, restaurant tech is in its, as its own thing is a little challenging. Um, and I ended up moving to Boston as a result of that. Um, and over that next 10 year period, um, 11 year period, sorry, um, it was a really interesting journey into itself because I ended up doing a lot of mobile, 
um, becoming an expert in that t entire domain. Um, I had to, as a consultant or uh, working for other companies, I, I got a chance to work on apps like uh, the HubSpot app, Bloomingdale's, nice. uh, Rulala. Um, I was, uh, I used to lead the mobile team over at Constant Contact that does email marketing. Wow. And then um, I did uh, emergency notification stuff uh, with geolocation stuff at Everbridge and then also at Toast. But, so, it, it's, it, but it's, it, it's not like the, the iPhone coming out is, was your influence to go back into the space, right? You're like, hey, oh, massive yeah. opportunity. Got to take advantage of this. What, what's going on over here? I, I knew right? that it was going to change things, right? Like small Absolutely. teams would now be able to go and write code and then deploy it to millions of people. Totally. And then you could use it every single day. Like what we see nowadays and the capabilities around having your camera and geolocation and having the internet in your pocket, being connected. Yeah. Um, all of these things are a result of having that, all that stuff in one place. Yes. Yes. And, and so you, you say a lot about, um, obviously your experience doing both, your, your mind thinks in both directions. What, what do you have to say about all these restaurants that have just taken so long to adopt to tech? Because I mean, it's one of those things where, look, we're, we're a restaurant marketing agency. I see it all the time, obviously. I mean, we see restaurants oftentimes, oftentimes, not very rarely, oftentimes we will see restaurants that are still doing pen and paper payments. We still see restaurants, I live in Venice Beach, California, that are still only accepting cash. I mean, what do you have to say about that? That is, I mean, what kind of opportunities are they missing? Is, is it math? How big is it? Oh, it's massive, right? Like, yep. Like, think about it. Like, let, let's back, back up, right? So when, when, I got into, when I got into restaurants, right, 2000 time frame, like that predated Facebook, that predated Amazon, that predated Apple, Apple was on its last legs. You know, Uber and, and and Twitter. None of these things existed. Yep. Like, internet was around. Um, you could buy things online. You could at, at the time, like you could download music. Yep. But that was the world back then. And, and back then, that was far ahead of where restaurants were at the time. Uh, IBM and NCR were probably the big behemoths in terms of restaurant tech, like POS systems, basically. Yep. Fast forward to two thousand nine. Um, you know, that year when we had that big recession. Um, it was really Aloha and Micros. They were now the big players as P the major POS systems. Lots and lots of features. Um, and OpenTable was probably the more considered the more bleeding edge. Now I'm sorry, but OpenTable at the time they had a great website. Lots of lots of restaurants posted, and um, it was a list. It was an online list. Yep. And they they marketed themselves as CRM. They're not CRM. I've done CRM before. Um, the CRM is customer relationship management is around having data around your customer and understanding them. Restaurants use them for like a list, your birthdays, um, and maybe how often you've come in before. Yeah. And so that was considered um, bleeding edge the year that the iPhone came out. Wow. Right. And so now you fast forward now and you, to your point, even now, 10 years later, we still have a fair amount of residual from even from that time frame. And, and I actually get it. It's because, you know, the kind of people that restaurants typically attract, right? The, the, the barrier to entry is a lot lower than some other industries. You don't need to go to school for 15 years to be a doctor, right? Totally. And so um, a lot of people may come from a slightly different background and it's also very hands-based, right? You're like touching things, you're creating things. And so there's a creative physical thing about all this stuff. And then mm. you got the hospitality side. Like these are things that don't necessarily speak to you know, um, using one of these things every single day. So I sort of get the resistance. Interesting. But this is changing, right? Like, like yes. nowadays, the entire general population, everyone who's about 30 years on and under did not know what it was like to not have email or the internet. Yep. And so if the restaurant game in general, you know, the people actually doing the work is a young person's game, then that means that a lot, a big chunk of your customers, as well as the, the people actually doing the work are used to doing this stuff. Yep. And so um, we run the risk of sort of being dinosaurs and sort of aging ourselves out. Absolutely. And so we're, we're in this really interesting tension point between we've got the older way of doing things, like, you know, the, the, the pen and paper. I, I worked for a fine dining restaurant once that wrote all the credit card numbers in a reservation book. Oh, God. <laughs> so I so, so stole the book. Like, that would be bad. You, oh. like, you've got PCI compliance and all this. Like, there's all these good reasons to have technology to help with some of this stuff. And we're not taking, getting the full benefit of a lot of this stuff. Yes. Yes. Okay. Wow. That's, I mean, I, I think the, the way that what you explained to us just now, the, 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 the mindset that so many of these restaurants have working with their hands, hospitality, knowing these things, focusing on those things and ignoring tech. It, it makes sense. It makes sense. Cause for me, I'll tell you, it's, 
it's sometimes a little bit frustrating when you're, when you're trying to get someone to understand the value in digital, right? I'll, I'll tell you for us example, right? Big thing is obviously we, we focus on helping restaurants get customers through digital marketing practices and strategies. Hey, I'll tell you almost over 50% of the time when we sign up a restaurant, they're still doing mailers and they're still challenging that mailers are more effective than a text message or an email or social media. And you know, it's, it's one of those things where some of these people, they're, they're so stuck in their ways. They're so resistant to change. But I think now at a time during what's happened to all of us and around the entire world, COVID-19, obviously the obvious, um, do you think some of these people now are, are obviously being forced to change now, right? I think this is something that I think a lot of people, a lot of read, read up online is that I've read somewhere that it, someone was saying that 20 to 30% of restaurants that were in business pre-COVID will not be in business after COVID. Do you, do you think it's, oh, it's higher than that? Wow. What do you um, think we're looking at? Like 40 to 50? Minimum. I hate, wow. I hate saying it. Um, David Chang, uh, two months ago, a month and a half ago, was saying 70 And he was like, I don't, like, oh my God, 70%, you got to be kidding me. And I don't think anyone really believed him. Yeah. More recently, I've actually heard, like last week, I heard numbers like 80%, which I don't even, like, that's insane, right? Crazy. One out of every five restaurants gone. Um, I actually believe that it will certainly feel like that. And things will probably, you know, there will yeah. be opportunities. Some things will swing the other way. But it, 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 we're going to get a bloody nose. There's no question of this. Wow. Um, we are all being forced to have a hard look at our lives. Like everyone, like literally, I was on a call last night with someone who opened the cloud kitchen in India last year. And he was asking him what's it like over there and everything's on lockdown and and they're the the exact same issues, right? Yes, yes. It's the whole world because of COVID-19 and and all the, you know, the cascade effects of all of that stuff. And what's really interesting is it's forcing us not only to take a look at just how we do things in general and how we think about health and everything, but it's also surfacing all these gaps, whether they be socioeconomic or, um, uh, you know, how to your point about how we think about marketing and how do you do, like, you can't do a sandwich board if people aren't walking down the street. Like, so how do you get in touch with people? Right. And so it turns out that there are a bunch of these like digital formats, online ordering becoming, I don't want to even say, um, uh, uh, encourage it. So it's almost required. If people yeah. aren't out and about, you know, if people aren't out and about and, and coming to your physical location, then you got to go to them. Yep. And if they're all just literally distributed all around, how do you go to them? Well, it turns out, and, you know, one of the things that technology does is allows us to go to them uh, virtually. You can, you can, you know, reach out to them and connect, uh, you know, email marketing is all about um, having that communi- asynchronous, so uh, not real-time communication channel with that individual. You have the ability, the power of email is you can have an email list of 100, 1,000, or 100,000 and blast yeah. out stuff as frequently as you want. Yep. And also pull them back in to say, hey, um, your birthday's coming up. You want to come in for a free cupcake or Mother's Day, uh, you know, res- Mother's Day next month, you want to quickly grab your reservation. This is how it's traditionally done. But because of COVID-19, we have these tools that are available to us that uh, allow us to be able to engage and re- remind and, 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 and tell our customers that of all the new crazy things, ideas and things that we're trying to do. Yeah. And it's not even really a choice. It's sort of like the, the restaurants that can figure out how to adjust and adapt and pivot and leverage these things will be the ones that have a major, major advantage. And everyone else is at risk of just dying out, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and that, that tears my heart out to say Yeah, it, it's survival of the fist at this point, right? It's, it's one of those things where you, you talk about how restaurants have been resistant to some of these new technologies and it makes sense as to why, but now more than ever, you cannot be resistant. You'd have to adapt or you're gone. And there's, a, there's that, a timer on every timer single on restaurant. Yep. Wow. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. And so you're saying, okay, so online ordering as a requirement, you, you know, talk to us also what you think about online ordering, because when you look, when you put yourself in the shoes of a restaurant owner, you know, the options are limited as of now, right? So you, you have your third party apps, you have all these other emerging companies coming up that allow you to order directly on your website, um, online menu, uh, takeout or delivery options becoming more and more available. Uh, do you have any specific fra- favorites that you recommend that you look at? Or is, is there a major leader in the game? Or <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know. You didn't realize I was, I was at Toast, right? <laughs> That's you, a little bit of <laughs> 
Yes, yes. And, and we would, so we would say Toast is definitely a major leader too, but I'm saying in, in what regard though, it, are they, we'll, we'll talk about specific online ordering, right? Um, sure. Would you say so, so me, still, even then or? So yes, but let okay. me walk you through why. There's a little bit, Perfect. Of, let me do a little bit of a history lesson. Yes. So I, I came to Boston in 2009. Um, the first two and a half years after that recession sucked, right? Like, like yeah. broke, trying to make my mark in mobile, all the rest of it. Um, and I wrote my own uh, apps for restaurants and stuff like an inventory app, a cooking app before they even existed online. And I, at the time, and even later on, I did a tour of Boston startup scene and I started trying to figure out what, you know, I've talked with VCs and, you know, for years, the VCs were all like, no restaurants, man, no way, man. They, they, they are so ancient. They don't want to listen. The only way that they're so busy that you can't reach them via email or, or whatever else you've got to actually go on site, yeah. not worth it. And so even from 2009 through 2013, 14, slow adoption. And that's when Uber and Airbnb were getting really, really big and all the rest of it. Yeah. And what was interesting is, is that after Uber and Airbnb, um, DCs were trying to figure out where to dump their money and stuff. And <laughs> someone somewhere came, restaurants. Restaurants is the last, is, is the last um, uh, place where, that, that's untouched. And so they dumped 20 to $30 billion in restaurant tech. So for the last six years, there, there's been a flood of restaurant startups. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of all sorts of types, whether it be inventory or scheduling, or let me make a website for you, or let, here's, yeah. let me build a mobile app, like all of this stuff. And it's frustrating to, I'm sure every single restaurant operator knows is they're inundated by phone calls, like screw off, like I'm in the middle of service. Totally. But there's this, this, this entire ecosystem that's very vibrant and very diverse that has sprouted, which is awesome. Yep. Now the problem is that everyone, the problem with engineers, and I can say this because I'm an engineer, is we get all excited about the tech. Yeah. We go, oh, wouldn't it, would, wouldn't it be a great idea to do blah, blah, blah. And, and they're looking at it through the lens, a very specific lens that they know. Yeah. Whereas the restaurant ecosystem, for anyone who's in the ecosystem knows that it's sort of a, sort of like the curtain behind the scenes. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens behind the scenes. And the problems that you see on the outside are not necessarily the problems that they're doing every single day. Yep. And so there is that tension in that delta. Now, the, the companies that, it, it's a mess out there because there's so much choice right now. There wasn't before seven years ago, but now there's so much choice and you don't know which one's which and you don't have the time to sort out. And so restaurants will do things like, they'll say, oh, I know I got to get, uh, get an online thing. I don't got time to make a website. Like, I don't know that skill set. I know. My friend told me, go sign up for Grubhub and automatically out of nowhere, 20% of uh, the, the revenues increased by 20%. And so you sign up and then magically like, boom, all of a sudden your the, the ticket printer is going and then your the restaurant's busier. Yep. The dining room's more filled. Congratulations. You know, win-win, right? Well, it turns out the, for the, all the three third-party delivery stuff, they think that 30% is not sustainable. Totally. Now, the players that are really helping the players that are really moving the needle for restaurants are the ones that a really get what, what restaurant operators are dealing with mm -hmm. B are thinking about the technology stack and how to integrate them and make them easy to use. So, right. So for, let me give you, for instance, at toast, we, you know, you sign up with toast and everything, and there's a whole bunch of people working to try to get your online sucked into the system and everything. And yep. then if you decide, uh, I want to make my um, website, uh, make a website online, they literally click a button and boop, all of a sudden you get a URL that is your website and you can click another button and whoop, your restaurant is now on the toast takeout app along with all the menus and stuff. Like, yep. Oh, it's literally that easy. Um, and so that's an example of if you take this thing and you take this thing and you design them so that they work living together, you get this added benefit of for not a lot of cost, um, very, very easy to implement and the scale that comes with all that stuff. Yeah. So that's one of the key, re those two things, right? keeping the customer in mind, trying to do the right thing for the customer. And then the third thing being the, that integration of all those technologies uh, and all those capabilities um, really unlocking things. And that's the reason why, one of the key reasons why uh, I really believe that Toast is one of the forefront leaders and will even on the other side of all this will likely continue to be. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I like what you said about, you're looking at this, this fees on third party apps, right? Like it, you know, the, the Uber Eats, the Postmates, the Grubhubs. I mean, that, that, let's talk about that because that is, that is totally killer. And the reason I say, I know there's a lot of options, but when you, when you look at it the, the eye, from the eyes of a restaurant owner during a, a crisis, 
you know, they're looking to us like, what should we use? We don't know what to use. All I hear of is about Uber Eats or Postmates or these apps. But that 30% is killer. I mean, like you said, not sustainable at all, right? We well, know. you tell me, if I asked you to take, if I said, you're going to give me 30% of your salary. So yeah. Let's did say you that, make that work? Say, I couldn't. Screw that, of course. <laughs> I'd have to like clean <laughs> my house. And, <laughs> you know, yes, exactly. But, the, but then also on top of that, w- which is something that I always preach that we, you know, we want our clients to understand is it's about the data, right? It, oftentimes you're using a third party app. The only thing you're getting on the customer is their first name. There's no ability to remarket to them oftentimes. There's no ability to, to track how many visits they made, whether it's I mean, a new I've, or returning I've, guests, right? I've been connected to people who've had conversations with those companies. And they, those companies like hold on to the info like, like, like this and, and for yeah. good reason, right? Because totally. – because it because they've got the marketplace they've got the relationship and so as long as they don't give you that relationship it's the it's the news yeah they're not the first ones to do this groupon did the exact same thing in the 2000s open table has been doing the same thing for 20 years open table had the website and and everything went through open table so what did restaurants do yes they signed up for open table and by the way it's extremely expensive like runs you somewhere between seven to forty thousand dollars a year Wow. And so if you're like a, a QSR, you can't afford that. And so this is why totally. it's reservation only and, and, and full serve and mainly fine dining only. And what most restaurants ended up doing over, you know, this is what they wisened up to because you pay, um, what was it? You paid a dollar or two per reservation through the open table system. So if okay. everyone's calling in on the open table uh, uh, or making a reservation via open table, you're paying a dollar per reservation. Okay. For a $200 meal, math probably worked. For a $15 meal, math doesn't work. And so what the restaurants did is they, for a dining room, they would have like two tables available and they would make that available on open table so it would list. And so you would be in the listings, but you could never get a reservation, certainly on a Saturday night. And then they'd force you to call. And then if you called and they made the re- they t- put it in themselves, you didn't pay. Oh my God. So they, they found a way, you know, this is 10 years ago. They found a way to bypass all that. Well, the current formula right now with, with Uber Eats and DoorDash and all the rest of them, there's not a really good way to bypass it. And it's actually worse. Those companies are actually being sort of sneaky by doing things like, oh, this restaurant doesn't have a website. We're going to make one for them. Or I'm going to put an Uber Eats phone number in there and redirect phone calls to me through Google SEO, search engine optimization, and then pretend that I'm the restaurant. And so that 30% actually is even bigger than the 30% because – if they're your regular customers, which you didn't need to cap, you didn't need to convince them to come eat here. They're only going through that channel because it's more convenient. Totally. You're now losing that 30%, which you, you know, normally that money would have landed in your pocket. Awful. This is the reason why nobody uses Groupon anymore because it wasn't a good deal. It took the industry eight, nine years to realize. And this is the exact same thing we're going through right now. And everyone can tell because there's all this conversation about third party delivery and it's not sustainable. So um, Toast so is one of the few companies that's actually trying to change this. And yeah. my suggestion, if you can, is just do it yourself. If you can figure out the minimum, like take some of the people that you would normally yes. be doing uh, in-house dining and have them be delivery drivers or whatever else. And then afterwards, like have them clean up or something like find, totally. find somewhere to use them, but don't pay that 30%. Oh my gosh, it's unsustainable. So, and do you, th- do you, and I completely agree with you. I'm on the exact same page. I'm glad you mentioned this. Um, do you think it's, it's an educational thing? Like some of these restaurant owners just don't know or what is the reason? Why do they keep doing this? Why are they continuously giving away their profits and not they, changing? They don't, they don't want to give it away. There's, there's a fundamental reason why you have to put, you have to back yourself up and put yourself into their shoes, right? Yep. You're working 16 hours a day, whether it be a little <clears throat> tiny mom and pop shop or you're an executive chef or op, front of house manager for a 150 person uh, operation, right? 250 seat restaurant or something. And there's not, not enough time to do stuff. And it's a, certainly a skill set and domain that you don't have a background for, right? And so the way that they measure success is fairly unsophisticated, to be perfectly honest. Right? And right. I say that in the context of like HubSpot or like, like Salesforce, how you might think about KPIs, key performance yep. metrics. What are, the, what are the five or 10 various metrics that you can use to evaluate success and whether um, a given marketing channel is working or not? The, the main traditional ways that we evaluate um, how busy a restaurant is are things like uh, covers, like butts and seats. How, how many yes. people are in the dining room? And as a chef, I never, I never understood it at first, but my chef would like walk into the restaurant and in, in a split second could know exactly the state that the restaurant was in or the state that the kitchen was in. And I didn't realize that he was actually using sound. 
if you've been in there every single day for like five years, you know what busy sounds like. You know what not busy sounds like. You know what uh, a busy dining room sounds like with nobody actually, uh, the kitchen not actually pumping out any food. Yes. And so they, they use those, the, the senses and that abstract, you know, in the moment mechanism to try to evaluate how busy is this restaurant? How, and how are we doing? Right. That's in the moment. Now on a, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, we can do our P and L and stuff like that. Good operators will definitely have that, all that stuff on lockdown. Oftentimes it usually ends up being you, you know, you, you give it to your account, whatever else they calculate all the numbers and in a lagging way, either at, at best a weekly cadence or monthly or quarterly cadence, you can actually see how are you doing compared to last year. Mm-hmm. As far as they know, they sign up for Uber Eats and then the next week people come in. So there's a very clear direct correlation. And they, the way that they think about it is as Uber Eats or DoorDash, or whatever, as a marketing channel, because that's how it's sold to them. Yep. I will do the marketing for you. And that's true to some extent, but it's actually, what's actually more accurate is I think it's more like, because these third parties, um, uh, delivery services now become more like a, like a service, like an Amazon, like you know that if you just open the Amazon app, you can probably totally. find what you're looking for. Yep. So people will just go, I wonder if blah, blah, blah restaurant it happens to be on there. Um, and that's not a very healthy dynamic or uh, system uh, to be a part of. And so the, that's, I think, the, I think they're one of the key reasons that, that, that uh, unfamiliarity with um, uh, the various technologies and tools, uh, not really good sophisticated measure, ways of measuring this stuff, and they, them thinking about it as a marketing channel, like email marketing, whatever else. And, and by the way, it's easier. It's far easier to sign up for Uber Eats or whatever else than to put the legwork in required to learn how to do email marketing. Yeah. Again, if I owned a restaurant, I would actually, a friend of mine was saying like, I, like we're in agreement that there's probably going to be this whole nascent um, new job formed around uh, people doing email and digital marketing for restaurants. Right, so, so outsource it to someone, <laughs> outsource it to someone who's totally. actually really good. Right? Like totally. ways of doing this stuff. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, no, I, and I couldn't agree more because it, it's one of those things where, you know, we, we run tons of ads and we work with restaurants in three different countries. And so we're, we got some pretty big ad budgets that we put out for our company. I have totally found that, that, that our messaging, when it's something of ease of use, uh, ease of implementation, those are the buzzwords that get restaurants super interested, right? Now, so what it sounds like for this, so for you, right? Okay, so you said they're unfamiliar with these technologies. Uh, you know, they're using bad KPIs. Maybe it's the sound that they're hearing in their dining halls, right? Uh, they're looking at a marketing channel, which, which is, I think, valid in itself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it sounds like for, for Toast, I know with like Toast Tab, that's allowing restaurants to actually own their customers, allowing them to actually get an order without giving away these crazy fees. Um, talk to us about you know, some other benefits to that, because I think, I think there's, there's some that are obvious, like not taking that commission fee, owning that customer. But oftentimes what we have found, and we've actually had some, some talks with Toast about this, is they say, Brett, we're giving restaurants so much data and so much opportunity to use this data, but they won't do anything with it. Is, 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 sounds like it's, it's kind of hitting a pain point, right? Well, this is, this is one of the things that I was always frustrated, even at Toast. I, I was in the conversation. Yes. With yes. Um, how can they better utilize these tools? And I mean, what would you tell these people? <sighs> it's, like, it's crazy, right? I feel so like exactly you're, 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 you're hitting the magic thing. The, he who figures this out will like, like, ta-da! Like, it'll, yeah. like, it'll be, <laughs> yeah. So much stuff will be better. Yeah. Um, the, the difference is, you know, like, are you providing them a tool to use or are you doing it for them? Yep. So if I provide you a tool, if I give you a hammer, well, like, even if you don't know what a hammer is, you're like, oh, okay, I can, I can, this thing's heavy. I can hit something with it. You're like, oh, you can figure out pretty quickly how you use the darn thing. Totally. Someone probably has to show you how to use the, the, that cloth thingy on the end to, to remove a nail, but it, you have to teach someone that, that more sophisticated thing you can do with the thing, right? That's yes. a fairly simple tool. Um, email marketing is more complex. Toast thing, even though we try really, really, really hard and do a really good job at trying to make it easy to use and all the rest of it, um, there's room for improvement. And some of it, by the way, has nothing to do with intention. Some of it is just because you have, it takes a lot of work to learn how to do good product development, um, to build the right thing and, and, and put yourself in the frame of mind of the person. The other problem is sometimes like it's, it's an engineer building it. 
Like, I don't like my engineers picking colors for crying out loud because they'll like pick the ugliest colors in the whole wide mm-hmm. world. Um, and so these, my point is these things have to be very intentional. And yes. so if you're intentionally building a tool, you're assuming the person knows how to use the tool or is willing to learn or has the time to learn. Yep. Uh-oh, time to learn, right? A lot of people don't have time. Case in point, there's one of the problems. So the other way to look at it is do it for me. So I just magically you push a button and, and, and stuff will just magically happen. And so there are, we are finding more and more systems that are like that. One of, why do I bring this up? Because mobile is very much like that. Uh, let's think about Amazon, right? Searching around, looking for things. And there's the buy now button, like click. And then the thing magically shows up on your door two yeah, days later. It's crazy. And like that brain dead <laughs> simple. And there's this really interesting thing that if we can figure out how to make something that simple or close enough to what they normally do that it's familiar, then the learning curves are not quite so bad. But this is, this is not that easy to do. And the yeah. more complex something gets, the harder it becomes. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and what you're saying about willingness to learn and time to learn, I, that, very, that very much so resonated with me as well. Because within our agency, we also have a course that we sell that teaches restaurants literally how to do everything we do. Well, I'll tell you right now, guess who's most excited about buying this program? It's not restaurant owners oftentimes. It's their agency partners or it's other agencies. Right. <laughs> right? Do it so for us. It, it's it, it's it's very interesting um there, by now, the way there will be restaurant operators that will figure this out yeah like, there are restaurant groups that have operations people or marketing people yeah um, of course that are realizing they, they need to make that shift yeah uh and 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 we'll figure this, some of this stuff out uh th- those that are scrappy and 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 creative will will try to do all of these kinds of things and and do you think so tell me this in in your opinion yes COVID has uh been insanely difficult for most restaurant owners to deal with totally understand that it, they've had to readjust their entire business but here's kind of an interesting question is do you think that the 50 or 60 percent or whatever it is are going to go potentially out of business forever because their unwillingness to learn or is is covid in your opinion really been that bad or is it maybe a combination of both because now more than ever you you have to adapt or, or you're gone and, and you, right now, granted, it's, they've taken a massive hit also, but is it kind of the combination? Do you see one more or the other? Or, or I mean, what, what are your, what's your there, personal opinion on things, this? These things aren't quite so simple. I've, I've, I, um, so case in point, I, I, oh, by the way, I left uh, Toast about a month ago. Uh, we, we were talking about Toast and this and that. We are talking yes. about impact of all this stuff. This, okay, so to be clear, we saw 80%, it was as soon as uh, COVID-19 hit and everyone started staying at home, 80% revenue drop across the entire country. Crazy. Okay? And it's not just here, like uh, happening in other countries as well. Yeah. And so the downstream effect of that is, is that not only are restaurants hurting, but every other tech company or every other company supporting restaurants are also hurting. Totally. Toast ended up having a layoff. We ended up cutting half the company. 1,400 wow. people are, were laid off, including myself. My role was eliminated. Um, some of the best people I've ever worked with, by the way. They're great. Um, if, you, if you find one, hire them. They're awesome. Yeah. Um, but however, like the, the cascade of this is very, very significant. Um, and when I think about, you know, what's going on in general, I've spent the whole last month doing nothing but like thinking about this stuff. Um, it's a combination of a number of things. I don't have it all figured out, but I do know, I do see some patterns. One of those patterns is, to be honest, restaurateurs, a lot of them don't know any better. You're asking them, if you're saying, you got to go online, that's a really far jump. And yeah. they really don't want to if they don't have to. And so some of them are just waiting to say, okay, well, like bury my head in the sand when this all opens up again it'll all go back to normal we don't know exactly like what the new normal is and how much but the reality is is that some of them are hoping that it will be enough at 50 percent, most restaurants will not be able to sustain themselves yeah maybe they can if they're bare bones it's like the owner and their brother and, and one other employee um at 30 percent, 25 percent, it's probably like that's it for like everyone practically. So unless oh, yeah. you're getting creative about doing delivery and take out groceries or beer delivery or uh, making semi-prepared foods or, you know, subscription frozen dinners or something like it's the, the model that you had is not sustainable. And the problem I, I've got is that a huge chunk, I don't know what the percentage is, but like 20, 25% minimum are in that bucket of, let me just open up and uh, try to get back to business. And if you don't adjust, 
there's a very, very real risk that it's, it's like the dinosaurs, right? Like the asteroid hits, whole world is covered in ash. Oh, look, it looks like it's clearing up. It doesn't clear up for, clear up for the next 10, 20 years and everyone dies. That's, it, the, that's the state we're in right now. Is, so is it fair to say that restaurant industry has officially changed forever? If this COVID thing doesn't go away, I think the world we live in has changed forever. I realize there's, there's two classes too, right? Like yep. there, there's the, you know, the, the sort of the haves and the haves nots. And I hate to say it, like essential workers and folks who are all laid off and everything, like we're hurting a lot. Yeah. And then the folks who were, who are in more white collar type jobs who can, um, who can work from home. Like at, when we were at Toast, we, we saw this thing coming and I told all my people like, we don't, you don't have to be in the office. Like people are starting to get sick and stuff, go home. Yeah. And so we just work from home and there was literally almost no change to our productivity. And like, I worked for seven years with remote teams. I know how to make remote work work. Yes. And yes. It sort of sucks that my dog will come up here and, and, and I want to play or my daughter will come in and I'll, I'll be on zoom, but <laughs> yeah. in general, like you can make it work. Yes. Um, restaurants, it doesn't work that way. And yep. so you have this bifurcation of experience. Um, and when we talk about work from home, there's some very clear stats that are coming about that are, I, I read something today, 20, I think the average is likely to be 25% of people who were working before will just be working from home from now on by choice, yeah. which means downtown, all those big office buildings, like it's one quarter less dense. So if you had a lunch spot that was really, really popular, you know, you're, you're, you're going to take a hit in density. Wow. Right. Like, so this is, and that's, in the, that's even if COVID goes away and we find a vaccine and all the rest of it. And if COVID doesn't go away, and by the way, I, I, I have uh, my, my brother uh, runs a, a biotech company uh, started in New York. He knows doctors and immunologists and stuff like that. I, I've been working with some, uh, some people who have been epidemiologists and stuff. Vaccines don't, you, you don't find a, a vaccine in a year. They take like 10 years plus. Yeah. And the reason is because there's a very rigid schedule and, and practice. And I get that they're trying to accelerate all that. But if you have like a 1%, um, if you, if you do a vaccine and, and everyone gets vaccinated, get a 1% death rate. Well, that's actually killing way more people than COVID will just because it's everyone who's getting it. And so it's not really realistic to expect that we're going to have a cure within a couple of months. And so we can hope and pray that all this stuff will normalize a little bit, but there's going to be residual effects and, and things have shifted in a fundamental way. And I don't think all of us, myself included, have fully realized to what extent they have, which means those people and organizations that have the ability to pivot and adjust and learn on the fly will probably be the ones that do the best out of all this. Yeah. And is, and I mean, and for those that are still resisting this, I mean, it, I hear it all the time. We're going to wait this out. We're, we're going to wait this out. I mean, what, what would you tell them? How much money you got? People ask yeah. me all the time, like, um, think about opening a restaurant. I'm like, no, man. <laughs> the fastest way to piss away a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's the fastest way. Um, and that's all you're doing. You're just, so the problem, okay. So the, the problem is even if you close a restaurant, right? Yeah. Food costs zero. Labor costs zero. You still got rent. You, you still got some utilities, whatever else to play, pay. And so, you know, the, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, yeah. Fundamentally, we, we've been talking about all sorts of solutions and stuff like this. Fundamentally, the, I think the biggest, the problem fundamentally is the business model is broken. And it's been broken for a very long time. And we just haven't been really admitting it and being honest with ourselves. Every other problem you see is a symptom of the fact that, it, that the math doesn't work around profitability. What other industry allows for a 4% average profitability? If I went to a VC and said, hey, will you invest in me? And uh, what's the likelihood, even if I was an expert, um, the likelihood that you'll get your money back, it's only, you're only getting a 4% return. They'd be like, they'd laugh me out, the, out of the room. Yeah. And so you have like labor shortage, tipping culture, masochistic culture, uh, food costs going up, um, uh, di diners don't want to pay anymore. Uh, Chef Kuntz in 2011 asked me, after a cafe closed, he asked me to join him in the venture uh, uh, around real estate. Yep. He had realized that if you don't set up your real estate deal to begin with, when you open, 
you're done for. You might realize it in a year, you might realize it in five years. Uh, you can't make the math work. And so I'm of the opinion, and I know there's gonna be a lot of people who, who disagree with me on this, but we need to take a hard look at how at the at the model uh, at how we how we think about restaurant profitability dollars generated per square foot yeah um, uh, uh, utilization of your employees uh, the the back of the house has, has a has a line uh, you got time to lean you got time to clean yeah. meaning if you're standing around chatting whatever else like go do something clean something whatever else and yep. really that's really right there's always more work to do so make yourself useful. Yep. Because if you do that, then you're more efficient. If you do that, then we don't need so many people to do all the work, blah, 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 blah. And we don't really think, we, we, the industry doesn't really think about profitability through that lens. We look at it specifically through the lens of labor and food costs. That's it. That's pretty much it. Yeah, not, not really much about efficiency. Be, right. And product, yeah. productivity. Here's a good one. Yeah. In the 80s, uh, let's use an example, banks. Yep. Go to a bank in the 80s, it's filled with tellers. You go to a bank now, there's like one manager, and then they direct you to the ATM. Or even better yet, you don't even know, need to go to the bank. Use your phone, right? So technology has unlocked the ability for you to do all the things mm. you need to do at scale, right? The, the bank doesn't need anywhere near as many people or as much real estate to do the same kinds of things when, and do other things like wire transfers or whatever else. Amazon's the same thing. Retailers, you don't need a whole network of retail shops. It's just this virtual store of literally everything in the world. I have no idea where the stuff comes from. I hit a button and it just magically appears. Isn't that so great? Right? <laughs> what do we do with restaurants? We don't look at it through that lens. We yep. have a very traditional way of looking at it still. And that's what I'm challenging all of us to think about to say, should we be, is there a better way of doing this? Should we be thinking about how things like technology can be a tool to help us unlock some of these capabilities? You're right. Yep. No, I, I love what you're saying about efficiency and productivity. We, we have a client in uh, Denver, Colorado, barbecue concept. And the moment COVID hit, he turned his entire catering staff, which obviously would have no purpose during this time, into basically a, an assembly line producing frozen meals that they could now send out for online ordering. For those who weren't packing and when they weren't busy, they became delivery people, right? So I think reworking your team, reworking productivity and efficiency is, is, is the move, obviously. But it's oftentimes, I think for a lot of people, it's, it's easier said than done, obviously, right? Um, of course. Uh, we had but another we a choice. Yes. Right? The, the world is changing around us. And we have to adjust to it. Ab or absolutely. Sit there and, wait, and hopefully it'll all come back. But I don't have a, I don't have a lot of faith that uh, it'll come back in time to save all of us. It, 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 see, it seems to me, though, like, from what it sounds like, at least, and, and there's a lot of opportunity. It's just people's, I think, maybe resistance to it. Is that it? The, better, the best word? Or is maybe, um, or is it an inability? Because I mean, a, a lot of these systems you're talking about, I mean, for instance, with, with toast, making it that easy. I mean, I, I'm trying to imagine what is the resistance still? Is it an education thing? Or do you think that they're so stuck in their ways they, they don't want to change and that they're still going to wait? Is it stubbornness? There's this a little bit of that. Every chef and every operator I ever knew was a bit of mild control freak. And, yeah. and, and, and often, like, like, don't get me wrong, you spend literally decades honing and perfecting. And so your domain, you assume that you know it well. Yeah. And you may or you may not. In all likelihood, if you're pretty successful, it was working well for you. So in your relative domain, it was yep. working. The problem is that your the, the world you lived in and your domain shifted. And so the yep. stubbornness and the, and, and is the, the recognition of how much it shifted and whether you're okay with it going back to normal or whatever else, you know, you know, just give me some time. It'll open up. We'll, everything will be fine. Um, so there's some of that, but there's also another piece that I, that's very important to recognize that I deal with this all the time with people in R and D, right? Like, even I, as a, uh, a chef technologist, always struggled with this transition of, you know, we talk about uh, business capabilities, technology, and everything else. But the reality is, is that restaurants are about two fundamental things. Uh, you, you hear restaurants being about manufacturing, custom manufacturing, right? I'm finding out what you like, and I'm making it. And I'm making it fast, quickly, uh, to a certain standard. Um, certain temperature to a certain expectation 
And then there's the hospitality part, the, ex the experience part. The how do we make you feel? Um, how do, what is the ambiance? Is it a social yeah. thing? Is it a, um, in, in that, that touchy feely humanistic kind of thing. And those things are true. And the problem is, is that the tech stuff and capability stuff doesn't really mesh well with the other ones. And so for years I was thinking like, well, yeah, operators are to totally justified in saying that they're different because they, in a lot of ways, it's a different hat you have to wear and the hats mm -hmm. are dramatically different. I've been thinking a lot about this more recently and I actually don't think it's all that different anymore. I think the difference is the, the form that it takes. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, this idea of hospitality, I've, I've heard even more recently, um, earlier on this year, I remember uh, Toast always has these guest speakers come in and talk and they, every single operator always talks about hospitality of their particular form, like a barbecue joint or yeah. you know, you're, it's, it's some cupcake thing and it, and it reminds you of cupcakes when you were a kid and stuff like that. Um, and we imply that it has, because there's a physicality to this stuff and there's yeah. a connection to this stuff that it has to be a, a physical geographic thing like you're like here and connectedness between people. But if you actually think about it, there's lots of other industries that have morphed and thrived that that, 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 that that use those same concepts that have evolved. I'll give you an example. Video games and social networks and social networks and video games, right? Like social networks are about people and connecting with each other and communicating and staying in touch, not necessarily at the same time. You can, you can, you can send me a mail and I'll read it tomorrow. You could be on the other side of the world, but I can, I can keep in touch and know everything that's going on in your life. Someone can broadcast and um, have a persona that they put online about everything about who I am and what I want to share with the world and people, friends and family can feel connected. Right? So that when we talk about hospitality and people and, Oh, this can't be doable. Well, it sort of can, it's sort of real time too, right? Like video games, the entire generation of people who are, you know, 25, 30 years and under, they've been playing video games that have always been connected. Yes. And so, right. You have all these online video games and some of the latest apps and stuff like that. You know, socialization, you hear about the high schoolers, they're, when they hang out together, they're all, they're all in the same room and they're all on their phones. Totally. Doing the same apps, doing the same things. Um, uh, emojis, they're a text representation of your face so that you can communicate. Yep. Um, e even Apple came up with their Animoji thing, which is like an AR. You can put a cartoon koala bear on my head and I have emotions. It's the same thing around feeling connected. Yes. So my point is, is that the... The, the format that this stuff takes is very different and probably so different that it's hard for people to wrap their head around. Yep. But you can accomplish the same goal though. Got it. We have, we have examples of that all around the place. Wow. That was just amazing, by the way. That's fantastic. I, I love this. <laughs> Some more people need to hear this though, because th this is exactly what we try to coach our clients on, coach and explain to our leads on, even when they want to work with us. We say the exact same thing. Hey, you, 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 we don't believe that the customer experience has to end after they walk out your doors. It just goes digital, right? That's what, what is social media for? What, what is, what is re-engaging with your customers for via email, text, whatever? What is the presentation of your food when they get it, when it's for delivery and takeout? Um, that was amazing. And I, and I, and I think I, I really hope a lot of people listen to this podcast because this is, this has been super informative. This has been fantastic. Um, what do you, what do you think? Is, is it looking at specifically online ordering, right? Knowing that the Ubers and the Postmates and those third party apps of the world are, are not sustainable. Where do you think those are going? Do you think they're still gonna be around for a long time? Or do you think that there's gonna be some new players in the game like Toast that come in that are gonna become more popular options? Or do you think they're still gonna be around for a while? I mean, for instance, Groupon still around, but obviously not doing too hot, right? Will that right. be Uber? Well, that's technology. Years? This is always technology, <laughs> right? Like technology yeah. always does this, right? Totally. Apple yeah. was, was the, the thing in the eighties and they literally were this close to dying. And then they became the thing in the, in the, uh, you know, two thousands. And then they became the bigger thing in the 2010s. Like there's always cycles to these kinds of things and the, and the yeah. players switch out. Um, one of the challenges nowadays is that the scale makes it, uh, makes the larger players more entrenched. So um, the, the big third-party delivery companies are not, they're talking about billions of dollars that they have. So they have some clout and some runway. Um, Toast jumped into this recently. Um, Toast launched, uh, I, I love the people I work with because they really 
I can honestly say, myself included, uh, that we really do try to do right by our customer. It's one of our core values, but we, we walk the of walk. Of course. And they actually introduced, um, I think they called it Toast Delivery. It was one of the th last things I worked on when I was there. And Toast Delivery actually does, I think it's literally $8 flat. Right? So if you have a $200 order, it's eight bucks. Now, I actually don't know if Toast is doing the delivery themselves. I, I vaguely remember them doing a partnership with another third party. Got it. Um, but the point here is, is that that kind of competition is going to drive things down and commoditize. So I have no doubt. You already see it. There's a, so much attention and this, they're, they're talking about consolidating and none of, the, none of the delivery partners are making any money, which translates to they're not going to be around in the same format five years from now. Which I have no evolve. doubt there will be, there, it will evolve. There will be a couple. But it, you know, uh, it won't stay the same. I have, I guarantee you right now, everybody, every single technologist is thinking about uh, delivery. Oh, delivery is all messed up. I can do a better job. And they're all going to try this. to jump. Yes. Everyone's going to jump, try to jump in. And it's going to make it even messier. Um, by the way, for all those technologists who are listening in, realize the restaurants don't want to hear from you unless you're actually solving a pain point for them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they get enough phone calls already as it is, right? In, so, in on this topic, though, so when it comes to takeout, delivery, online ordering, what is the biggest pain point of that right now? What, who, if someone was going to solve one problem specifically in that sector, what would it be? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what we see on the marketing side, and it's always a pain for us, is the food photos. A lot of restaurants you're speaking to, they, they don't understand that photo has to look good in order for someone want to buy it, right? That's one little thing. But in your opinion, maybe on the tech side, what is, what is the pain point? What, what, is this, what, is, what needs to get solved for these people? Okay, let me, let me let's back up a second. Let me walk you through what I believe a lot of people are successful about. A lot of operators, chefs, restaurateurs, yeah. whoever. They are successful because they understand their domain. They are representing a product or an experience. And they're carefully controlling all the elements of that, the, the delivery and the ambiance and the expectations and everything. And they're delivering that experience to make people, to instill a certain feeling. Yeah. Right? And so people feel good. I don't care if it's a, you're eating a McDonald's chicken McNugget sandwich uh, versus going to, you know, uh, you know uh, the French laundry. <laughs> they're very different experiences, but there is an expectation and experience that is controlled by both organizations. Yeah. And, and, you know, those operators that do very, very well understand that domain and the variables, and they try very, very hard to control all those variables so that you have a seamless experience. Um, why do chefs yell and, and, and yell and scream and stuff like that? Because they spend decades learning this stuff, and, you know, it's, it, it, everything always wants to go uh, haywire, and they're trying their hardest to, 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 to control all that so that you, the customer has a consistent, good experience. So the problem we have with online ordering and uh, you know, in-house in uh, house di uh, dining versus delivery and all the rest of it is, you no longer have control over all of those elements. Yeah. The online experience, if it's not the operator setting it up, it, to your point about pictures, it's you know, it's it's not their pictures of the food. It's the you know whoever, you know, taking photos on Instagram. Yep. The operator will make might make the food. It might be perfect, and then they have to you know, shove it into, they have to shove it into a delivery box. I laugh because I actually still see Joel Robichon and John Shores today. <laughs> John Shores is delivering in New York. Like, oh my <laughs> gosh. I don't know how you do Michelin star food in a little tiny. Yeah. Box, it's right? crazy, right? It's crazy. And so they're, you know, ideally you're controlling that, but then you're handing it off to a delivery guy and the delivery guy's riding a bike and he, you know, he picks it up and he's, he's, 45 minutes late and he's jostling the thing and he just drops it, drops it on the table. And then when the person opens it up, the liquid, you know, it's not in the right package and liquid spilled all over the place. Like that's not a very good experience. And so what we really need to do is to take the same focus that operators have around that experience and make the judgment call around what are, what are acceptable trade-offs and figure out how do you want to do this yourself? If, for instance, if you decide that you want to have, um, uh, do in-house delivery, you know, maybe between the hours of six to eight o'clock or something, you do in-house delivery of your own people doing it, then you can train them to, you know, make sure that they're, that they know exactly how to do it and all the rest of it. Yep. Uh, or maybe you're okay with, with having a third party delivery guy do it, but then maybe you want to do things like, instead of having the, the bag sitting there on the countertop for 45 minutes, throw it in a hot box. If it's hot food, keep it in the hot box. 
it's going to be food safe now, yep. which is actually a big deal with COVID-19. And at least when the guy gets there, it will still be hot. Yep. Right. So that, that requires us to think through beginning from when the person uh, decides that they want something yep. all the way until they actually get it in their hand. Got and it. That's hard right now because it's fragmented. Got it. Got it. Wow. This has been super insightful today. Ben, really appreciate it. This is, this is, this is amazing. And I, and I think so many listeners who are listening to this right now, I think are probably getting so many awesome takeaways. Ultimately, it sounds like though, what you're saying when it comes to producing a great product, which is the food, um, giving a great hospitality experience, which doesn't have to be just dine in, could be also through delivery. All these things can be achieved. The, the ultimate goal of restaurants can be achieved through take on delivery but it's a matter of maybe controlling the experience from beginning to end all the way through. And obviously hoping that you can do as much as possible on your own platform with your own people, essentially, right? Would be the not goal. Not all the platform, so true, but not all the, uh, the, the, your own people or the network of connected people you have, their capabilities is the way that you, that you how you execute that. The, the fine line of the kind of balance between the two, essentially. Right. Yeah. Not all technologies are the same though. Like Toast is far ahead of some other ones. And there, there are some other players that are far ahead, but it's a, if you look at the entire ecosystem, it's a yep. mess. Yep. Um, Toast, I can honestly say Toast is one of the better ones out there. Um, people get all hung up over the credit card rates and stuff. Like that. That's in the, in the grand scheme of things, that's a small, you're talking about like 0.1%, 0.2% of yep. every dollar. The, the bigger deal here is really around understanding what the tech can, what you're trying to do, and then trying to understand what the, how the tech can help you with that stuff. If people have, questions or anything else um i'm creating a new website called the mobile chef dot online cool. um, you can stay in touch with me via that um and i'll probably post more info and and, and have resources available uh to help people with uh trying to sort out how they do some of this stuff got it got it um ben again this has been super insightful uh for everyone listening uh i got a lot of value out of this today i hope all the listeners did um, guys, if you do ever want to check out some more about Ben, go to the mobile chef dot online, right? That's my correct, right? Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, any social media handles also that we could follow you on? Um, it's funny because I haven't been doing uh, Twitter and stuff like that all much. I, I probably should. So Ho Benjamin, H-O Benjamin. Perfect. Uh, Twitter. Perfect. And then I'll, I'll have LinkedIn and everything on there as well. I have one final thing I want that's really important that I, I just remember that's really important for everybody. Yes, of this course. This COVID-19 stuff is serious. Um, yes. We're every, the entire country is right now talking about opening back up and we're all sitting and waiting on when, what this new normal will look like and, and how yep. is everyone going to execute. I've actually been working with a bunch of food safety experts, so Ber Berger uh, Food Safety Consulting, who, who's well known in New England for working with restaurants around uh, how do you do uh, uh, food safety stuff so you don't get uh, creamed by the uh, health and safety department, as yep. well as relevant systems. Those, those group, and, and Brandon Hicks as well, who used to be the chef at Mistral, I've been working with all those folks for several weeks now around trying to understand the um, COVID-19, the new safety standards. There's a lot of stuff out there, whether it be CDC, FDA, all the rest. It's literally all over the place and it's messy. Um, two things. Number one, uh, I suggest everyone take a look at Food Code Pro, foodcodepro.com cool. and look at the COVID-19 stuff. There is a wrap a uh, reopening action plan that tells you everything you need to think of when you're reopening from a health and safety standpoint so you don't get people sick as well as an inspection report that you could run every single day if you wanted to basically say hey uh are we doing the right thing um these are the kinds we actually we've worked we've talked to the nra fda uh massachusetts public health we're working with certain towns this stuff is actually, um, it's funny because nobody really wants to stick their neck out because of the accountability thing, yes. but they've all said that this is awesome and this is exactly the kind of stuff that restaurants need to adopt and look at and educate themselves on. The reason why I'm highlighting this is because what I'm seeing in general, people are going to get other people sick, right? Like, and, and that's not no good for any of us because then Absolutely. all this stuff's going to shut down again and we're going to be right back where we were before. Yep. So educate yourselves and try to figure out how to do the right thing. And it poke me if I can help with anything. Yes. I don't know, Ben, this is, so one more time. So it's foodcodepro.com you're saying, right? Okay. So guys, be sure to check that out. What I'm going to do, Ben, also is I'll have all those links below on this podcast. It'll be on Spotify. Uh, it'll be on our YouTube channel, all that kind of stuff. So they'll have a link to it. Um, but Ben, again, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, I, you know, we'll, I think we'll probably be in touch with you. We'd love to chat some about some other concepts with you. I mean, it sounds like obviously 
you got some amazing experience in the space. I think people will really benefit from potentially another one like this. So we'll see. But hey, appreciate your time again. And uh, we'll be in touch real soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks for having right. me. See ya. Bye.